been this edition of Southern Newsweek. Outraged fans are unhappy about the brevity of the Boney M show as they begin their New Zealand tour of Dunedin. A proposal to permanently remove three kilometres of free car parks along State Highway 6 at Franklin troubles many locals. And a Dunedin City Councillor has come up with an ambitious $20 million plan to save Dunedin's Cadbury's factory. Good evening, I'm Craig Storey. Boney M outraged fans last night when it opened its tour of New Zealand with a 50 minute long concert in Dunedin. Some fans considered they had been shortchanged by the remnants of the 70s disco group. Reporter Roselle LeBone was there. Seventies disco act Boney M opened its seventh city New Zealand tour in Dunedin last night. But for the audience, filling nearly three quarters of the town hall, the show did not progress as expected. They thought Boney M would be on stage by 7.30pm, but that did not happen. Folks advertising on the website saying the show was between 8 and 11 o'clock tonight. Because of the website, I expected it to um, start at 8. The guy that was on first, that was just repetitive. It was, just was shocking. Boney M hit the stage just before 9pm. 50 minutes later, the show was all over, leaving fans just a little upset. Phone in. They friggin' finished too early. It was very short. It was very brief. Where's the concert even? Also, I was a bit disappointed in the sound where we were sitting at because the background um, music was um, muted. And Lighting and sound effects was disappointing. It's appalling that we've paid nearly $100 to listen to that for 55 minutes. Singing with backing tracks as well, not real music. It's a cabaret act, it's not a concert. It's just crap, absolute crap, I'd like my money back. News Talk ZB's Chris Lynch took to Facebook after the show, noting consumer magazine editor Sue Chetwin's comments the group had only one original member and was therefore a tribute act at best. There are several different forms of Bunny M that tour the world with different original members. So legally, they're not doing anything wrong. But I do think they have a responsibility to be really honest about what you're saying. Otago Daily Times features reporter and music journalist Shane Gilchrist considers the promotion of the act was disingenuous and tickets were too expensive for a 50 minute set. Most shows you'd go to from international acts, be they nostalgia acts or be they a current act, you would expect at least 18, possibly more like 22 songs in their set. There's six or seven paragraphs and if you read those paragraphs carefully you you do get a certain expectation that perhaps some of the original artists are going to be there. Classic promotions were unavailable for comment at the time of publication but publicist for Knickknack Media Nicole Thomas expressed surprise at the length of the Dunedin concert and says Boney and will be amending the start time for the rest of their tour. I'm Roselle LeBone for The South Today. The Cadrona's Alpine Resort's new $10 million Chondola is expected to be finished on Saturday. Final checks are underway and as The South Today's Kerry Waterworth reports. The Chondola is a cross between a chairlift and a gondola and although the snow hasn't arrived yet, the Chondla is now almost ready to carry skiers from the Cadrona Alpine Resort's base building to the top of the field. This is different to any other lift there is on a ski field in New Zealand uh, with the cabins and the chairs. So that's the main differences for this one which makes everything slightly more complicated. With a mix of six-seater detachable chairs and eight-person gondola cabins, it can carry 150% more people than the 30-year-old chairlift it replaces. Installing it over the summer had its challenges. Any project on a mountain there's obviously always a lot of difficulties. Uh, we did have a lot more snow than expected through this summer. We sort of anticipated snow on the ground uh, every, every month. We had it on the ground every week. The Chondola will be officially opened on the 10th of June. I'm Kerry Waterworth for The South Today. 
A proposal to permanently remove free car parks along three kilometres of State Highway 6 at Frankton is being welcomed by the Queenstown Airport Corporation, of course, but the Frankton community is concerned that residential streets in the new Frankton area will become the next hotspot for those looking for free parking. Mina Amso has the details. Parking for free along State Highway 6 near Queenstown Airport will soon be no more as the result of a decision by the New Zealand Transport Agency. That might upset air travellers used to leaving their cars behind while flying out of Queenstown Airport. But the move has been welcomed by the Queenstown Airport Corporation. Um, from talking to residents and visitors alike, that um, there, there are safety issues with people backing out onto a state highway. Um, there are also issues with regard to the look and feel um, as sort of your introductory view of what it looks like to come to this region and, and the aesthetics um, that sometimes really um, are impacted by that. As an alternative, travellers will be able to park here and catch a bus to the airport. This is the corporation's new park and ride facility, due to open on the 22nd of June, after the completion of the new Stage 1 Eastern Access Road projects. The facility will have 150 car parks for people looking to travel for two days or more. Kiel says its capacity will be increased to 300 by the end of the year. The Frankton Community Association Chairman Glenn Lowers has welcomed the initiative. Certainly happy that they're doing something. Um, hopefully it gets um, well used, um, especially once it's coupled with the public transport system and everyone gets on board for that. With that, it um, will certainly make a difference. But he says the community is concerned cars are already parking in Frankton's residential streets. Well, it's happening now, so it's just going to... We're just concerned that'll probably compound the problem. The Frankton community is now concerned. Streets like this behind me, Robertson Street, and the Remarkables Crescent might become the new car park alternative. The organisations who are responsible for monitor, monitoring and enforcing the, the, the parking restrictions in those areas, it will be down to them working with the community, if you like, to ensure that people who are parking inappropriately don't do so. Lower says it's up to the Queenstown Lakes District Council to enforce restrictions on the illegally parked cars in the area. Mina Amso, The South Today. The bluff oyster industry is concerned that a new strain of banamia could find its way from oyster farms on Stewart Island into the wild oysters of Fovo Strait. A raft of measures have been put in place to stop the spread. Here is The South Today's reporter Ruby Spink in Bluff. Fovo Strait is famous for its bluff oysters, but for 60 years its oyster population has fluctuated because of the Bonamia parasite. Now a new strain of the parasite, Bonamia ostrae, has been found on two Stewart Island oyster farms, and the worry is it might spread to the Fovo Strait's wild oysters. In an attempt to prevent that, the Ministry of Primary Industries has put new regulations in place on Stewart Island. We've put in place some um, legal controls under the Biosecurity Act in the form of a, a controlled area or movement controls. Um, so, you know, any no shellfish um, uh, can be moved out of the, the zone that's infected, so in and around Stewart Island, um, and any vessels or, or equipment associated with um, marine farms where there are uh, flat oysters present. And that'll just prevent, um, you know, the risk of oysters being moved somewhere else and, and then spreading uh, the parasite with them. The bluff oyster industry is also taking its own action to make sure people in the industry are aware of the risk of the new strain of Bonamia and minimising the effects of the existing strain. Oh, the potential risk is huge to the, to the fishery. I say we've seen, you know, we've seen mortality. You know. The strain of Bonamia already in the Fovo Strait cut the oyster population by about 90% or around a billion oysters in 2003, forcing the industry to reduce its catch. Legally, or under the, under the ministry rules, yeah. we could harvest 15, but it's, a, it's an industry initiative, a conservative approach, um, and that's driven very clearly um, from, from, from a, it's a real bottom-up process. We have a lot of discussions with science, uh, with skippers, um, uh, and then skippers to quota owners, and so it's a, it's a decision that everybody is part of that decision-making process. The public appetite for oysters is demonstrated each year at the Bluff Oyster and Food Festival, 
And the public was reassured this week about the Bonamia parasite. It's not a food safety concern. Um, but we certainly would recommend people eat fresh, healthy-looking seafood, and if anything looks a bit off, uh, not to eat it anyway. Um, but it wouldn't be the bonamia that causes any issues there. There's no known way to eradicate the naturally occurring parasite, but the good news is that it doesn't affect other shellfish, such as green shell mussels and Pacific rock oysters. I'm Ruby Spink for The South Today. A Dunedin City Councillor has come up with an ambitious $20 million plan to save Dunedin's Cadbury factory. Jim O'Malley wants the public to invest in a new company that would operate part of the factory and he has already achieved $70,000 in pledges already. Roselle LeBone has more. The gates were set to close for good on Dunedin's Cadbury factory in 2018. But now a ray of hope by way of an ambitious plan put forward by recently elected City Councillor Jim O'Malley. If you'd asked me last night, I would have been quite nervous about it, but I think the response has been immense already. Well, it's only been up about an hour, and we believe we've got the first $70,000 pledged. O'Malley launched a website yesterday to register public pledges towards his goal of raising $20 million to keep part of the factory open and operating. The plan is to raise the money to get all that equipment into the one spot, into the one building, and then bid for the third party manufacturing with Mondelez for the Jaffas and the pineapple lumps. What that gets us is um, experienced Cadbury workers inside the factory and all the equipment we need to keep going forward. He told the South today there are many parts of the factory that are viable. So what we're looking to do is um, buy equipment that currently makes pineapple lumps and jaffers and all the stuff you're familiar with, chocolate fish, out of this building here and move it to this building here. So a lot of the cost of what we're facing is actually the moving of the equipment rather than the buying of the equipment. And then we want to buy this building and inside this building is the dairy plant. So that's the chance to move back towards making dairy milk chocolate as well. O'Malley is also considering purchase of the dairy processing plant. Ultimately we'd like to get the dairy unit operating again to make dairy milk chocolate um, but that's that's the third phase of the process but to not own it now would mean that you've got somebody else owning that equipment in the middle of your factory. Wanderley spokesman Jake Patton says in a statement we've received a number of inquiries from interested parties however apart from acknowledging their interest we have not engaged in further discussions with any of them to date. We are continuing to do the work required to establish a formal process and will get back in touch with interested parties in due course. O'Malley says the factory will continue to make Cadbury products, but the long-term goal was for the factory to create its own brand. I'm Roselle LeBone for The South Today. Coming up on Southern Newsweek, snow and frost greet riders in the 37th annual Brass Monkey Rally at Idaburn Dam. The Ashburton Council has been gifted Chinese heritage buildings and is preparing a plan to restore them as a heritage village. Welcome back to Southern Newsweek. Snow and frost have greeted riders in the annual Brass Monkey Motorcycle Rally. However, the weekend temperature stayed above freezing for the 37th running of the event. The warmer than usual conditions of the Idaburn Dam at Oturiahua were happily greeted by one of the most regular attendees. This is John Tunzelman's 36th Brass Monkey making him one of only a handful of people who've attended almost every single motorcycle rally. The first time we came here, we had to scrape three or four inches of snow off the ground before we put our tents down. Then slept on it, snow, no, tent, no floor in the tent, but we had some old sacks. And when we took the tent down the next day and lifted up the sacks, the snow we hadn't been able to scrape off was still there. So. There wasn't even a dent in it. We hadn't, <laughs> we hadn't melted nothing. <laughs> This year, he rode to Oturiahua on his Honda ST1100. Oh, very nice. But other years, he has come on various old English bikes. A Vincent Black Prince, a Vincent Comet, and the legendary Vincent Black Shadow. John Willems, one of the organisers, he says that some of this year's rally-goers were wishing the weekend was a bit cooler, of course. 
The descendants of the original Chinese owners have given the stewardship of their land and the buildings to the Ashburton Council, which is now preparing a plan to restore them as a heritage village. The area has been largely abandoned since the 1960s. John Keast has more. This is one of Ashburton's historical secrets, a Chinese market garden village. It was born in 1920, rose to prominence in the 1940s and 50s, and now it's a selection of tumble-down sheds, but there are plans to save it. Let's have a look. Chinese market gardeners grew and sold vegetables here. They lived here. They worked here. At one point there was a school and the site has a rare and restored Chinese oven, a brick lined pit into which food was lowered from an overhead gantry. A problem for the many Chinese owners though was that the land and so many titles it could not be sold. So several years ago the owners approached the Ashburton Council to offer the use of the land for the benefit of the district. The council said yes. It has now employed an heritage expert, Arlene Beard, to prepare a plan for the village, and that should be with the council later this year. An early suggestion is to use some of the 2.3 hectare site as a community garden. The council is also seeking money to help with the redevelopment, and the hope is to restore sections of the village to tell the story of how Chinese families worked and lived far from their homeland. Still to come on Southern Newsweek, research takes centre stage of the Omru Blue Penguin Colony as its redevelopment takes shape and crowds lined Main Street in Gore to enjoy the 30th Gore Truck Show Parade. Welcome back. Research has taken centre stage of the Omru Blue Penguin Colony as its $660,000 redevelopment enters its final stages. The layout of the building has changed, a new research laboratory has been built and a rehabilitation centre for the birds established on site. Life is good for the little blue penguins at Omaru's Little Blue Penguin Colony. Not only is the $660,000 redevelopment in its final stage, there are also solid signs this will be a good breeding year. Life's good for a penguin out at sea. If we've got a, a good number of penguins coming in, you know, they're good weights, that's a good sign that things are going well. And then to top that off, early eggs is another indicator that, that life's good out there at sea because in a really rough year, as I say, they won't start laying until late. She believes the science has always been in the background of the facility. However, the redevelopment is bringing it into sharper focus for the centre's average of 70,000 visitors per year. Agnew says there are already some eggs in nests, which is an indicator of happy penguins. We've had our first eggs laid for the season, yeah. so very unusual. We haven't had eggs laid in May since, well in 20 years, and since 1997. Yeah. The penguin colony at Oamaru is managed by Tourism Waitaki. Its general manager, Jason Gaskill, says the redevelopment has not significantly increased the size of the colony. However, he says there is both more space for researchers and greater access for visitors during daytime. The colony now has a Department of Conservation permit to care for up to 12 of any of New Zealand's penguin species. Daryl Bazer, The South Today. In sticky conditions, eight horse teams from Canterbury and North Otago worked heavy soil in mid-Canterbury for the 67th ploughing match of the Heinz Young Farmers Club. The two and four horse teams turned the soil in less than ideal conditions. It's very boggy, but competitors included veteran Colin Drummond and John Booth of Ashburton who were competing in their first horse ploughing events. Horses are regulars at the Heinz event, but this is the first first time eight teams have been involved. Classes included vintage qualifying, open and horse events and a silver plough competition. Alongside the horse teams were plenty of these, the iron horses known as tractors.
Still on a mechanical theme, uh, crowds lined up on Main Street in Gore recently to enjoy the 30th outing of the Gore Truck Show Parade. The winner of the annual Gore Truck Show, Alex McClellan, says he's humbled and proud to have been part of the show at the weekend. Other winners include Brett Harland from Southern Transport with the best tip truck, Richard Roche from JPM Holdings with the best tractor unit, and Darren Taylor from McDonough Contracting with the best light vehicle. It's now been 40 years since the first parade was held way back in 1977. And that about wraps up this edition of Southern Newsweek. Please be sure to like us on Facebook, check out our YouTube channel and Twitter so you can keep up with Southern News via our website, channel39.co.nz. I'm Craig Storey and this has been Southern Newsweek. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.